Welcome to this video on heritage and inequality. In the last video, we discussed what is your heritage in order to understand the significance of being able to articulate what we see as our own heritage and why. We have also shared our own views with each other. Now, we look closely at how and who defines heritage in the formal everyday sense. When we understand who defines, assigns and manages heritage and why, we can examine the choices made in these processes. Who defines heritage? The short answer is that the nation states define heritage. UNESCO guides and advises, but the nation states are those who define heritage. The World Heritage Convention has set criteria for listing sites. The UNESCO guidelines originate, though, from Western notions of heritage, aesthetics, and also from Western heritage experts. In this context, inequality often means that some nations and also some communities lack the resources to protect heritage. But in some cases, they also lack access to the heritage itself. You might ask, how can nations lack access to their heritage? We will discuss this in the next module on ownership. However, there are cases of disputes of collections and monuments moved from their country of origin, like the Greek Parthenon marbles. There are cases of lack of representation, misappropriation or discrimination by dominant groups, while also potentially undermining the local traditional infrastructure for the protection of heritage. The issue of ownership is very much linked to inequality. We will also discuss UNESCO's role in determining ownership of heritage. However, it's important to discuss inequality in relation to the World Heritage List itself. UNESCO doesn't play an important role for the correcting inequalities per se, However, it's working on building inclusive policies, as our UNESCO expert Kusio Spitz informs us in the upcoming interview. Here, you can see an illustration of the distribution of heritage sites per country. You can see that Western countries are highly represented. UNESCO is being encouraged by communities around the world to diversify the list and for the notion of diversity to be included in the World Heritage Policies. One of the recent policies is that of the Declaration of the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage. This was an attempt of UNESCO to include what heritage means beyond the World Heritage Convention of 1972. However, it's not enough. Therefore, one of our experts, Manuel Mai, advises we need to ask how can experts on heritage contribute to improving current policies and, and assisting national and international policymakers? In addition, how can we understand how indigenous peoples define heritage and ownership? And he asks how can policymakers integrate these indigenous ontologies into the mainstream definition of heritage. We will look at indigenous heritage management systems later in another video, but on the issue of policies, our UNESCO expert, Kusia Spitz, has this sobering answer that UNESCO is as good as its member states want it to be. It simply cannot put up sanctions or physically intervene locally. So, if nation states do not recognize diversity and include this in their inventories and nominations, UNESCO cannot do much. In terms of indigenous views and heritage approaches, UNESCO set up the Global Strategy, launched in 1994. The Global Strategy is for a representative, balanced and credible World Heritage List, and its 
aim is to ensure that the list reflects the world's cultural and natural diversity of outstanding universal value. The Global Strategy and the World Heritage Committee make efforts to do training, upstream processes, financial support for nominations, and minimizing the number of proposals of countries per year. In that context, some may question how UNESCO can help promote the fight against inequality while the World Heritage itself is criticized for the lack of equality and representation. Let's quickly look at how UNESCO misrepresents the image of the list as it appears on their website. You might be fooled to think that there is an even distribution of sites. However, when you zoom in, there is no equality at all. For example, Europe has at least three times more heritage sites listed than Africa. In addition, our UNESCO expert, Kusia Spitz, also points out that as long as there are countries that continue to put forward nominations while sitting in the committee, and by allowing countries to lobby for inscription of sites that do not have sufficient protection mechanisms, a fully balanced list will not be reached. Inequality and heritage do not only occur in the World Heritage List. In fact, one might say, after looking at the map, that it reflects the inequality map of the world. Where we have the least heritage represented, we also have the most poverty. Obviously, this is a generalization. However, diversity is not only an issue for non-Western cultural heritage, but also the Western heritage represented in the list is arguably lacking diversity. Many of the European sites are Christian cathedrals and Greco-Roman architecture. While diversifying the notion of heritage, the Intangible Cultural Heritage Declaration of 2001 seems to again perpetuate the same inequalities. The nations listed are mostly the same countries that already have strong representation in the World Heritage List. In the upcoming videos, we will further discuss inequality and heritage from the point of view of nation states and inter-nation state politics. I will use South African heritage in my next video, including the recent Roads Must Fall movement. Furthermore, in the case study, we will discuss the case of the World Heritage Site of Hockland in the Netherlands, a site that captures the struggle of a community facing the threat of the sea and ingenuously protecting itself and its heritage. See you in the next video.